Welcome to the Thick and Mystic Moment, the show that's all about uncovering the secrets of personal transformation and celebrating the incredible stories of those who've dared to change their lives. I'm your guide, Robert John Hadfield, and together we'll explore the power of change. Let's get started. On September 7th of 1860, a girl was born named Anna Mary Robertson, and she would have one of the most significant and definitely one of the most unique success stories in all of American history. She was born in Greenwich, New York. She was the third of 10 children, and three of her siblings died before adulthood, which was, we've talked about it in the show before, that was common. It was normal when you would start a family, you would expect that some of your kids wouldn't make it. And so her story, uh, Mar- Anna Mary Robertson's story, really started uh, when she was almost five years old. Her father had promised on a particular day to bring her home a red dress. And when he came home that particular day, no red dress. He had instead brought her home some paper and some crayons or chalk or something to draw on it. And she was very upset about this. And father very apologetically said all the stores that you would buy such things as a red dress were all closed. And the reason they were closed was the news had just come down that the president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, had just died. And so all he was able to bring home was some paper and some stuff to draw on it with. Now, that seems like a really, really not a big deal in today's world. But when you remember that paper was just not that common back in the mid-1800s. They had only recently figured out how to make paper out of pulp, wood pulp. And so it, it, it just so having paper back in that time was actually kind of a treat. And so, like a lot of kids, Anna Mary Robertson really enjoyed drawing and doing artwork. But it wasn't, and, and although that would become a really, really big part of her life, it wasn't until much later in life when she was really able to dive into this love of hers, of art. Because like a lot of kids at the time, when she was 12 years old, She was hired out to make money for the family, and she went and worked with a wealthier family. And she did this for about the next 15 years of her life until she was in her late 20s. And when she was in her late 20s, one of the places she was working, a man started working there by the name of Thomas Moses. And and she fell in love with this guy, and they got married. And it's hard telling this person's story, Anna Marie Robertson, because her story took so long to really, really happen. And you'll understand why as I explain this here. So she, she gets married at the age of 27 to this man named Thomas Moses. And so now her name is Anna Marie Robertson Moses. And the two of them work on various farms and, and kind of have this partnership where he's, uh, you know, the, the, the breadwinner, but then she works to try to make money too. Well, the two of them have 10 children together, but five of them die in infancy. And, but in her partnership, in their partnership, she, again, he's, he's bringing home, you know, he's working on the farm and, 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 and the, the, la- the main laborer in the family, but she brought home money too. And she actually started making jams and jellies and butter and potato chips. And she used to sell potato chips by the, by the bucket. And it, it's just so interesting thinking about this stuff. But so then when, when she was 45 years old, they bought a farm in uh, in Eagle Bridge, New York, and this would be the where she would spend the rest of her life. And she was forty five at this time, and I talk about this success story. But she's forty five years old, and no one has any idea who she is. <laughs> she's still just working a farm, it's pretty normal housewife stuff. So, nineteen oh five, they they buy this farm in Eagle Bridge, New York. 1918 was when the love of art that had started when she was four years old really started coming back. And at this point, she's 58 years old. 
and she's putting some wallpaper up in the house. And this is one of those really, those things I talk about when I talk about these thick and mystic moments, these things where things, where your life's going this direction, then suddenly it changes. And sometimes you realize it and sometimes you don't, but your life's about to make a big change. She's wallpapering part of her house and she doesn't have enough wallpaper. And she has this big spot area that needs to be covered. And so with no wallpaper, she takes this, what's called a fireboard, which is a big piece of wood that you put in front of a fireplace to keep critters from getting into the house through the chimney during the, the, the summer. And she does this nice little painting on this fireboard, and she, then she puts it over the empty spot on the wall. And her, her husband comes home and this is kind of cool. I really like this thing. And so she, he kind of encourages her that she should be doing more with her art. And then she, you know, dabbles in it and starts doing things like embroidery, needlework, that kind of thing. And in 19, in 1920, sometime in the 1920s, her husband then dies. And also at the same time, her daughter is dying of tuberculosis. And so she goes to spend time with her daughter. Now she's 67 years old. Now remember, I'm talking about a success story. She's 67 years old and and she's just living on a farm doing normal farm work. And she's got a daughter that's dying of tuberculosis. She goes to spend time with her, and while she's spending time and helping her out, she's doing more of her embroidery. And she creates these beautiful kind of landscape things with this embroidery and with this yarn and does these really neat things with texture. And her daughter, who's, who's dying, her daughter Anna, asks her to just make more of these things because she likes them so much. Problem is... Now at the age of 67, her hands are very arthritic and she's having a very hard time doing this needle, uh, doing this embroidery and using these needles. And her sister suggests, well, you've painted before. You're really good at this stuff. Why don't you spend more time painting? So Anna Marie Robertson Moses starts painting and she's able to to manipulate the paintbrushes more easily because of her arthritis in when the a few years later when the depression starts a woman by the name of carolyn thomas who has a drug store offers to uh, offers her store as kind of a women's exchange where different women can bring their goods into this drug store and sell them to try to make money during the during the depression and Anna Anna Marie Robertson Moses takes five of her paintings and puts them in this drugstore where they sit and sit and sit and gather dust she's in her 70s at this point and in 1938 when she's 78 years old a man by the name of Louis Calder is coming through town and he has a headache and he stops at this particular drugstore and he sees these paintings and he asks the person there at the drugstore, who made these things? And she proceeds to tell her that it's this woman, Anna Marie Robertson Moses, that lives on a farm not far from here. And he says, well, tell you what, I want to buy all five of these paintings and I want to know where she lives because I need to go visit her. So here he was in 1938. She's 78 years old. And he goes and he buys these paintings and he goes to the farm where she lives and he says, can you show me some more of your work? And she has 10 more paintings there and he buys all 10 of them. He takes them with him to New York where he starts showing them around to people and saying, because he's discovered this kind of amazing, what he thinks is this kind of amazing folk artist. 
he also sends her some better paints and he tells her, look, you just keep painting paintings for me and maybe they'll just be for me, but I think I think there's something really special here. In 1939, he managed to get some of these paintings in a little exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art, and it was just at this little exhibit called Contemporary Unknown Painters. And a few people see it, but not much comes of it. And then he, as he's showing these paintings to other people, he finds this other person that has a, that has a gallery who sees these things, and he's particularly interested in folk art. And in 1940, she's now 80 years old. And in 1940, this particular, uh, the, the person that has this gallery decides to take a bunch of her paintings and put up a show. And they don't even use her name. The title of the show is What a Farm Wife Painted. They don't use her name because no one knows who she is and no one would care anyway. But they start showing a bunch of these paintings from this 80-year-old woman living up in New York. A, uh, A reporter who had seen this exhibit was very impressed with this folk art look that she had created and wrote an article and referred to her as Grandma Moses. And from that moment on, when that article came out, she became known as Grandma Moses. And it was, and the artwork she did was so, it was so interesting because it, it, where, where so many people paint, you know, a landscape and you'd see this perspective that kind of goes off she painted these things that that looked like they were kind of instead of this way they were kind of this way and everything in the perspective everything was kind of in front of you and it was very colorful and very lively and fun and 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 just kind of captured this this beauty of in some interesting way this beauty of america from from specifically the 1800s because that's what she would in many of her paintings was she was drawing memories from her childhood and what the world was like in the 1800s. Well, amazingly, here she was, this 80-year-old woman. They, they did this, this thing, uh, the, <laughs> this particular show of her paintings. They asked her if she wanted to come. And, and to tell you a little bit about her personality, she decided not to come to the show in New York of all of her paintings because, as she said, I've already seen all of them. <laughs> So, it would, uh, what's amazing about this now is within a few years, her paintings were starting to appear on Christmas cards. Uh, by 1946, her paintings were being seen on prints and things around the, wor- around the country. In 1949, the President of the United States, I think it would have been Harry Truman, brought her to the White House and gave her the Woman's National Press Club trophy. And she was getting honorary doctorates uh, from different colleges. And in, matter of fact, in the 1950s, Edward R. Murrow had her on a television show doing an interview with her, one of the early color broadcasts, to look at her artwork and talk to her about what she had created. And here she was in her 90s painting pictures and getting more and more well-known around the country. No one even knew who she was, really, before she was 80 years old. And somehow the entire world discovered her after this. When she turned 100 in 1960, her birthday was almost seen as a national holiday because she was so well known and so beloved as a character, as an, as, a, as an artist and as a personality. And in 1961, again, her 101st birthday. And that was the year that she died in 1961. 
And to let you know how significant she was, John F. Kennedy, President of the United States, actually made a statement when she died, and this is what he said. The death of Grandma Moses removed a beloved figure from American life. The directness and vividness of her paintings restored a primitive freshness to our perception of the American scene. Both her work and her life helped our nation renew its pioneer heritage and recall its roots in the countryside and on the frontier. All Americans mourn her loss. A woman who was barely known by anyone prior to the, her age, but prior to being 80 years old. Her career as an artist started <laughs> when she was 80. And over the next 20 years, 21 years, she would go on to paint. And I think in the end, she had something in the neighborhood of 1,500 paintings. In 2006, one of her paintings sold for $1.2 million. And one of the things that not many people know was that the, the show, The Beverly Hillbillies, Granny, her last name was not Clampett. Her last name officially in the show was Moses. And many people say that the reason that she was called Granny, that her name was Granny Moses, the, the Irene Ryan character that, that played G Granny, uh, was in honor of this beloved character in American history, Grandma Moses, is what, how she was affectionately known around the country. So I bring this up today because I found this interesting little article written about her. It's very short, but it's so powerful. I want to share this with you. This came out in March 1st of 1953 when she was 93 years old. So she was still alive when this was written. And the article is called Grandma Moses Medicine, written by Gerald W. Johnson. And he starts off with a quote from Grandma Moses's autobiography, her life story. And this is what it says. Then Anna was born, so I had four babies to care for. But we got along very nice till the children got the scarlet fever. That was a hard year, but it passed on like all the rest. And then he starts this article. These two sentences constitute Grandma Moses' complete and unabridged account of her ninety of one of her ninety-two years. Again, she was only ninety-two at this point, or uh, when, when this article was written. She would live for almost another decade. Its brevity, I believe, goes far to explain why Grandma has lived into her tenth decade. She is not inarticulate. She can describe in loving and minute detail after 60 years her wedding dress, a Thanksgiving dinner, a practical joke she and another girl played. But about a hard year, she found nothing worth remembering except that it passed like all the rest. Nobody can explain genius, so exactly what it was that made Grandma Moses a magnificent painter, no man can tell. But if you want to know why she is alert vigorous, radiantly alive at 92, mull over the above bit of philosophy. Beauty, love, laughter, and delight are imperishable memories. But all that is important about hardship is that it passes. How right she is. If we could only remember this truth in the hard years how many spiritual scars and deformities we should escape, and how much more abundant would life be in the years that are given us. I thought that was a really beautiful sentiment. It's not that, it's not that difficult years aren't important, and it's not that we need to learn lessons from them. The idea here is not to focus on the negative things that have happened to you, 
look back at all of the beautiful things that went on. And that's what she did when she painted. She found all the wonderful, colorful, beautiful memories from her life and created these beautiful works of art, like I said, one of which sold for over a million dollars less than 20 years ago. And she created a legacy. Her paintings can be found in galleries and private collections around the country today. But it was all focusing on the beauty of life and allowing those difficult moments. I mean, the difficult moments she's talking about here, a year we got along nice till the children got the scarlet fever. That was a hard year, but it passed like on like all the rest. That instead of spending time on all the difficult and challenging things and looking back at the horrible things that had happened to us and dwelling on the negative, focus on the beauty. Focus on the wonderful things that happened. Here she was, discovered discovered as a painter at the age of 78 and became known around the country for the first time for the beautiful things that she was creating when she was in her 80s and went on to really change the the attitude and the, the, the feelings of the country, reminding people of a beautiful time and of the color and the, and the wonderful things that happen in our lives. And this person attributes her long life to the fact that she didn't dwell on the negative, that she really spent her life thinking of all the wonderful things. She lost half of her children in their infancy. And yet somehow looked back at her life and saw beauty, positivity, and found wonderful memories. And perhaps that's important for us to think about. It's so easy for us to get caught up in the negative and all the things, all the challenges the world has in front of us and all the difficult things and the pain and the, the awfulness that we can find all around us. And rather than that, find the color, find the beauty, find all the wonderful things, all the wonderful things that happened to us day to day, year to year, and keep those at the forefront of our thoughts. And we do have so much to be grateful for. We don't lose. We don't lose half of our children before adulthood. We have so much to be grateful for in our world today. We have so many blessings. Do we recognize them? Spend some time thinking about all the things that we have to be thankful for, all the beauty that surrounds us every single day because it's there in abundance and make that the focus of our energy. Thank you for joining us on another Thick and Mystic Moment. We hope today's episode has sparked your curiosity and ignited the flames of change within you. Remember, you're not alone on this journey. Stay connected with the Thick and Mystic Moment on all major social media platforms. Please come and share your thoughts with us and share the podcast with your friends and anyone else seeking transformation in their life. This is Robert John Hadfield signing off. And remember, do something different today. <laughs>